The most widespread danger from nuclear explosions is fallout. Fallout is dust that is sucked up from the ground by the explosion. Fallout can kill. You can protect yourself and your family. And later on, we will show you what steps to take. This is the cover for Raymond Briggs' graphic novel, When the Wind Blows, and I think it's about as perfect as a cover can get. We see an elderly couple stood as though they are posing for a photograph, smiling and happy. But just behind them looms a mushroom cloud from a nuclear bomb, with white flames and black smoke, burning so hot that the window they're looking out of is melting. But despite certain doom, still the couple are smiling. So, are they just very, very hopeful? Or are they incredibly naive? Well, let's join this couple on the brink of nuclear war and take a look into the radioactive horrors of when the wind blows. After all, it'll all be over in a flash. Now, if you know about Raymond Briggs, you know he was kind of famous for creating these sweet magical Christmas books. So when he came along and wrote this heartbreaking story of how innocents are affected by nuclear war, it was the last thing which many were expecting. If you were someone who liked The Snowman or any of his other stories, and you saw this, you'd be very surprised with how dark it gets. Now, even though When the Wind Blows was created as a graphic novel, it was later adapted into an animated film, and both are incredible in their own way. Most of the time, the film is essentially a word-for-word -word copy, but there are a few, sometimes pretty strange, changes that I think make the film stand out as its own masterpiece. Hey, come, come back, on. you stupid bitch, and Lie get down. in the shelter! Very quickly, you realise this isn't your average animated movie, because, well, for one, it doesn't open to animation. When you press play, you might be caught off guard for a second, as we see real life footage of the military assembling in the streets of 1980s Britain, among threats of incoming nuclear war. So what's going on? Have I put in the wrong movie? Well, no. The sleazy DVD salesman behind the pub has in fact not ripped you off. When the Wind Blows is multimedia, meaning some things are 2D animated like the characters and the landscape, some things are 3D stop motion models like the house and the objects within, and some moments like the opening use real life footage. It's a way of reminding you that even though this is an animation and at the end of the day a fictional story, stuff like this has happened and very easily could happen. Nuclear war is a very real threat, and so when the wind blows always has one foot in reality. It doesn't let you get lost in the fantasy of 2D animation for too long. This opening footage is dark and grainy. Things are far from calm, as the low rumbling of engines seamlessly transitions to a song from the late, great David Bowie, named When the Wind Blows. That's the name of the movie, a song made specifically for this film, and this song perfectly foreshadows the story which is about to take place. It's a song about hope in times of hardship, from the perspective of a loved one who's passed away, or is at least on the brink of death, saying his piece peace and goodbyes, opening with Don't Be Down, It's All In The Past. The song then gets darker, with Bowie singing about how he's never felt the sun, and his dread for when the wind blows. The language starts off hopeful in the first verse, but by the time the second comes around, the wording is much darker. Bowie talking of savage wounds, anger, spitting and taunting, and ending on the inevitable no matter what. And although we're only at the beginning of the story, and this song holds little meaning at this moment, as the film progresses its relevance becomes morbidly clear, like the mention of the hidden sun, likely blocked out by toxic clouds, or his fear of the wind because of the radiation it carries along the land. As the song plays out, the darker anxious footage of the military turns out to be from a newspaper, which our lead fella, James, is having a little scroll through. The the film has finally transitioned into the animation we expect, and it's all a bit more peaceful, at least for now. As he returns home on the bus, we get a good look at the beautiful British countryside. We see a young couple joking around with each other, having a nice time. Everything about this first act feels like a fairy tale. They want to paint this picturesque world full of life and colour, so it's as devastating as possible when it all gets taken away. 
And it's the same with this man's home, a cute cottage painted in many colours to make it feel as vibrant as possible. When he arrives back, we meet his wife, Hilda. Hello, dear. Hello, love. Who also goes by ducks. This couple clearly care a lot for each other and have been together for many, many years. They do jab and moan at each other, but it's not in a malicious way, it's more of a, oh, you, what are you like sort of way. Uh, I'm not going to ruin the paintwork, James. Oh, don't worry. I can soon touch it up after the bomb's gone off. Life is good for them, but just like the opening clips from the newspaper, signs of incoming war begin to bleed into this fairy tale. The international situation is deteriorating rapidly and that war could break out at any time in the next two or three days. Now, the importance of war in the graphic novel is shown by setting up patterns and then breaking them. The whole book has a pretty similar look, small square panels side by side, usually around 30 a page, and the speech bubbles are contained within these squares. But when the radio announces that war is likely coming soon, the speech bubble cuts out of this box and into the white space. It draws your eyes to the words and makes them feel more important. And when they cut away to the nuclear bombs, submarines and planes off in the distance, they take up the entire page, not a speck of white. It really makes this couple feel insignificant in the grand scheme of war. Another sausage, dear? Now, if you heard that a nuke might be dropping down in your country over the next few days, I assume you might panic just a little bit. But our couple seem oddly calm given the situation. After all, it'll all be over in a flash. Obviously, there's always threats of nukes being tossed around, so I feel like we're almost used to it at this point. But here, this isn't just warnings. We've seen the military assembling, and the public are being told to prepare. People are panic buying. There's no bread ducks. Sold out. It seems to be some sort of panic purchasing. But you see, our couple have a special tool which will see them through any trouble that a pesky nuke may cause. And that tool is government advice. A few years before the graphic novel was released, the British government rolled out the Survive and Protect scheme, which contained a guidebook as well as instructional videos on how to best prepare yourself for a nuclear strike. You can protect yourself and your family. And later on, we will show you what steps to take. As well as surviving the fallout and nuclear winter which follows. And whilst we see nothing of the instructional videos in the story, the visual style of the film is heavily inspired by these videos. They both use a 3D model house combined with simple looking characters. And if you look at the objects within their home, like the bottles of water, food, and wooden doors, some of these shots are identical. It feels like the couple are living inside one of these instructional videos. And the husband's approach to the government advice in the form of these guidebooks is one of the more interesting parts of the story. He has complete faith in them. You're not saying we've got to stay in that thing for two weeks. Well, yes, dear. Ours not the reason why. Now, we must do the correct thing. Even when the advice is questionable and contradictory. If there is no solid cover, lie flat in a ditch or a hole and cover your head, face and hands as fast as you can with some of your clothes. I think it's kind of a blend of patriotism and trust in his country, as well as a defence mechanism. In a survival situation, you want to believe that those in charge are going to have it all under control, tell you what to do step by step, and if you follow these instructions, that everything will be fine. After all, the couple have survived World War II, and the instructions and government advice helped get them through then, so it's no surprise they feel this way. Churchill. Roosevelt and Stalin. But this is a different kind of war, one which no kind of guide will help truly prepare you for. And the advice hasn't had time to catch up with the advancements in weapons technology. The guidebook seems more like a tool to help ease the public's concerns rather than actual advice. You can follow every word in this book and it'll still be a half measure. There's actually an article by the Daily Mail discussing these guidebooks and how experts have claimed that they were insufficient. One reason being people won't stay in Inside for long enough, they'll want to leave. You must not go outside until it is absolutely safe. 
it tells them to take the doors off their house to construct a refuge with. The kind of refuge that might help with a shell bomb and might just protect you from the shockwave of a nuke, but will do nothing to protect you from the radiation that follows. It's clearly outdated, but the couple believe it'll be enough. And the reason the couple are still thinking in terms of outdated warfare is due to their past experiences. There's a scene where the two recall their time during World War II, when both of them were just young children, and they seem to have actually enjoyed their time during the war, because, well, they survived, but also they had fun in their shelters. It's funny to think there's no shelters this time. We had an old Anderson in the garden. I can see it now. They look back at it with rose-tinted glasses while sweet lullaby music plays. They weren't old enough to be involved in the war, so they don't comprehend the true horrors of it. So it's no wonder they think it'll be similar this time around. And one of my favourite things about this story is how it explores the differences between traditional war and modern war. At times, it can almost seem as though it's glorifying the old, but this is more the characters in the story than the story itself, and it helps to show how hard it would be for an older couple to come to grips with it all. I don't even know who the people are these days. I expect it's all done by committees, dear. Churchill with his cigar, old Stalin with his moustache, you knew where you stood. The husband is so knowledgeable about old war poems, leaders and tactics, but now he doesn't even remember who they're fighting sometimes, let alone why. Who's in charge now then? And this difference between the old and the new is even more prevalent when the husband picks up the phone and calls their son. But when his son answers, it seems he's not worried at all about the threats, joking around and singing. What do you mean we'll all go together when we go? It's not funny. And I think it's a smart choice to only show us the father's side of this call, because it leaves the son's words and actions more open to interpretation. The father thinks his son is being a goof, a silly fellow, but it's much more likely that the son, unlike old Pops, does understand the gravity of their situation. He knows he's going to die, knows they're all going to die, and is having a nervous breakdown. After all, he's a young man, so the chances are he'll either be drafted to go fight, or he's within the radius of where the nuke is likely to hit. But still, the father soldiers on. No, but it's our duty to carry out governmental instructions in time of war, son. Talking about duty and country, when in a short while, none of these things will hold any meaning. Both the husband and the wife seem to find comfort in different ways that both kind of stem from denial. James finds comfort in the government advice and the plan, whereas Dux just wants to get on with it, finding normalcy in their usual routine. It's like nothing is different. When she goes outside and blows the dandelions, she begins daydreaming this fantasy fairy tale of dancing butterflies. <laughs> This isn't the attitude you'd expect from a couple preparing for a nuclear strike. And all this calm and peace they approach the situation with makes the inevitable destruction on the horizon hit so much harder. If they were anxious and panicking the whole time, it'd be a constant reminder and you'd be more prepared for it. As the husband continues to follow the government advice, it begins to contradict itself, on one page saying to take the doors off the house and construct a fort, and then on another recommending to close the same doors to prevent the spread of fire. Keep doors closed to prevent the spread of fire, it says. But you've taken off half the doors, James. And yet this is what the husband is staking their lives on. But I guess, what else are they going to do? You couldn't just look up the best way to survive a nuke. This guidebook is all they have. And the saddest part is that if the couple hadn't have followed it so exactly, they likely would have been better off. Because they own a cellar. I wonder if we'd have been better off in the cellar. Oh no dear, too damp. The one thing that might save them in an emergency like this, keeping the radiation out and providing enough room to hold their supplies and more importantly, move around. And in the guidebook's defense, some things should be common sense. According to that article from earlier, the guidebook does say to use a cellar or basement if you have one, but they didn't publish the entire booklet, so I can't find the part which says this. There's a chance they might have been talking about the video guide, which does mention basements, but but it specifically says to use a room closest to the center of the house or a basement. The best place for a fallout room is the basement or ground floor.
Whatever room you choose, remember that the further you can get away from radioactive dust in or around your home, the safer you will be. So even if they had seen this, I can understand why they went with the room they went with. And just looking at the refuge, you know it's not sufficient. It's exposed on one side. And this again is actually not the fault of the guidebook because it says to cover both ends, which the husband doesn't do. Across the two open ends of your refuge, you should make thick walls of bags and boxes of earth or sand. So the way it works is you have a designated room which is as close to the middle of the house as possible and then inside this room is this little fort. Your fallout room will protect you but you will make it even safer by strengthening a small part of it. This part will be your inner refuge during the worst of the attack. And I love the framing change as soon as they step inside the tiny and claustrophobic space. The pair are cut off on all sides, taking up the entire screen with no room to stretch out. It's hardly the place you want to spend two weeks. Which was one of the main criticisms brought up in that article from earlier. As the couple finish up their preparations, the husband prances around the living room, acting out exactly how he thinks the war is going to go. Innumerate Russian hordes will sweep across the plains of Central Europe. One man, one vote. And women too nowadays, of course. Progressive King. And whilst there are ups and downs, back and forths, ultimately, he has complete faith it'll end well for them. And it tells you a lot about his idea of war. It's all strategy, calculated decisions, battles for territory, but a nuclear bomb involves none of these things. There are no territory battles because afterwards there's no territory left. But none of this seems to have settled in. The whole time they're planning out what they'll do if a bomb does come, it sounds like they're planning a picnic, sipping down tea whilst reading off a massive list of items they need. But despite it not being on the list, the husband remembers something about paper bags. He believes they need them, but he can't remember what for. I wonder if it's true about the paper bags, or is it a joke? His best guess is to deflect the heat, an extra layer of protection against the blast, but more on this later on, because finally it happens. The radio announces that an enemy missile strike has been launched on the country and they have just three minutes until impact. And the husband really took me off guard here. Take Come cover. back you stupid bitch and Lie get down. in the shelter! Keep in mind, up until this point he's been so passive and calm, and I gotta be honest, I let out a cheeky chuckle. But this outburst is really the moment it turns from this ideal fairy tale countryside couple to the more serious tone throughout the rest of the film. And the last words before impact are The cake will be burned! It's so ironic because well, everything's about to burn. People, trees, livestock, half the country is about to be set ablaze and still the cake is all that matters. It shows how personal this story is. Most nuclear disaster movies focus on the chaos, the survival, the panic, the incomprehensible scale of destruction, but when the wind blows is small scale. And so the metaphor of the cake is so much more fitting. As the radio gives off more advice that ultimately won't make much difference, the couple fall silent and we get some calm still shots of the peaceful home and countryside. One last little glimpse of what's about to be lost. And this is probably my favourite sequence in the film. The way they show the impact of the nuke is so well done. A quick white flash before an overwhelming cloud of pure black approaches on the horizon. And with each second that passes Passes, the colour is drained from the landscape, from green to black and white to sepia until the screen looks muddy and stained. The animation is sketched in a hurry with little consistency. It's chaotic and full of energy. You can almost feel the heat in the air of this sequence and the sound design is incredible. <laughs> It sounds like an aircraft flying overhead looped over and over whilst drums bang rapidly. It's all so overwhelming. And that line, the cake will be burned, plays again, but now it's distorted.
even the audio is falling apart. And then the shockwave reaches our cute little couple. And this is where the house being a real model didn't just look interesting, but helped to elevate the story. It feels like you can reach out and grab everything in their home, like you can step foot in it. So the devastation of the shockwave has so much more impact because you can see every single detail in the destruction. Because of the heat, all the colour is now gone. It's so far from how it looked in the beginning. They've had all these years together, even surviving through the war as children, going on to have a happy life, only for it all to be taken away in just three minutes. <laughs> Now, the blast in the book plays out a bit differently. For one, he doesn't call his wife a bitch. You stupid bitch and get in the shelter! He calls her a fool. And the last haunting line of the cake will be burnt is the same, but instead of focusing on the destruction of the town and countryside around them, you only see it from their perspective. And even though I enjoy how the film approached this, I think keeping the reader in the dark is the better choice. Because it means that throughout the rest of the story, as the pair are cut off and fending for themselves, wondering where everyone is, we are wondering with them. Of course, our best guess is probably that everyone is dead, but because in the comic we don't actually see it, it's easier to feel a fraction of the hope that the couple have, their mindset that everything is fine and continuing as normal. So how do they show it? At the moment of the strike, you turn the page and see a blast of white with hints of pink around the edges. You see, nuclear explosions are many times brighter than the sun. Turn the page again and we see what is probably my favourite page in the novel. The blast from the previous page looks like it's carrying over, and you get this gradient from the white to blood red layered over the same panel of the couple hiding in their shelter repeated over and over. And the closer to the blast, the more distorted and warped the panel is from the heat, as though the blast is washing over them. And then the next page, this blood red fades back to the white background we're used to, as the heat subsides and the panels go back to their usual shape. By the end, things seem to be back to normal, and this is the same for the husband's mindset. The shelter stood up well, didn't it? I constructed it in compliance with governmental specifications. He's back to hopeful and calm after his bitch yelling outburst. You stupid bitch! I mean, now the blast is over and they're alive, everything should go back to how it was, right? Ha! Wrong! Shut up! The blast is just the beginning, and now the real horrors are about to begin. The most widespread danger from nuclear explosions is fallout. You must not go outside until it is absolutely safe. From this point on, it really does feel like a different movie. Their once colourful house is trashed, burnt and covered in rubble. It's a constant reminder of the dire situation they're now in, because from their attitude, you wouldn't be able to tell it. Can it catch up, dear? When the medics get through, they'll probably just spray us with some antidote, give us a couple of pills, and in no time, we'll be as right as rain. Now, if you've seen HBO's Chernobyl or are familiar with the depressing side of YouTube, you'll know the effects of radiation poisoning and have an idea of how it works. In three days to three weeks, you're dead. Granted, Chernobyl was a nuclear power plant disaster that was continuously emitting radiation, which is different from a nuclear bomb where it's one big release that then reduces over time. But the devastating effects of the radiation are the same. After the explosion, the radiation is in the air and is then carried by the wind and rain. Hence the title and the grim nature of the opening song. When the wind blows is your worst nightmare. You want the poison rain to be carried elsewhere, or remain in the site of the explosion as the radiation contaminates everything it passes. Those who were killed by the initial blast really are the lucky ones, and I think there's very few things more terrifying than radiation, because, well for one, it's real. This can happen, and has happened. As of recording, there are estimated to be around 12 and a half thousand nuclear warheads out there just chilling. Good morning, Glenn! 
and also you can't see it. You could have been exposed to it and not even know. So your death sentence is already signed and you might not even realize it for days to come. And even if you manage to survive, the chances of suffering some nasty complications later in life are very likely. <sighs> You all right, yeah? After the initial shock, the pair's minds start to wonder about what's next. A bomb has been dropped, so it's only natural to assume the country is now at war. And so, to ease their worries about their odds, the husband lists off all the different Western forces war groups, whilst military parade drumming drowns out his voice. PRCS, Pyramid 7, ROCC, Airborne Warning. It's such overwhelming force and power, but it all means nothing in the face of a nuke. And even with all these organizations, they could do nothing to protect their own civilians. It's likely that many, if not all, of these organizations are now gone, disbanded or scattered after the strike. We learn from the book that the town the couple live in is called Clayton, which funnily enough is really close to where I grew up. So I would probably be dead. And this town is pretty far far from London, it's right near the coast. So if the strike did hit the capital, then everything in this circle is likely gone or ruined. And although we only know about the UK, the fact it cuts away to three different forces, a submarine, a plane, and a rocket, is a good sign that once the first nuke was fired, all the nukes were fired, and all the countries involved in this conflict are in a similar situation. The official term for this is mutually assured destruction also known as MAD. MAD? MAD? Yes, MAD. And this is actually the reason why nuclear weapons are seen as somewhat beneficial by many people. The idea is that powers can go, well, if you nuke me, then I'll nuke you. And if I nuke you, then he'll nuke me, and they'll nuke them, and we'll all just die. So no one go all nukey dookie. Practical nuke! The wife understands it as some kind of insurance. I think my old dad was in the mutual assured insurance. Which leads the conversation in a darker direction. You don't pay any taxes now, you're retired, Jane. No, I'm fully paid up. My funeral is fully assured. Even though he says this with a lot of happiness, his face quickly changes and you get the feeling that at the mention of a funeral, the gravity of their situation sets in even if just for a second. And from this moment on, his denial just continues to get worse and worse. The emergency service should arrive today. I'm surprised they've not come before. The way he talks is as though everything is going on as usual outside their home, surprised that the water, radio, and television aren't working. And this is one thing, but even the milkman and paperboy's absence puzzles him. Of course, we've seen a glimpse at the level of destruction, but they're still in the dark. And maybe the expectation that everything is fine is because of their son, who is almost certainly dead. We never see him or find out exactly where he lives, but my guess is some are closer to London, nearer the strike. But they never even have this conversation. Their son being dead doesn't even cross their minds. And I guess if they're gonna be in the dark about his situation either way, it's less painful to believe that he made it. I hope Ron and Beryl got back all right. Oh, yeah. Yes, they'll be all right. Our Ron's a very careful driver. And this mindset carries over to their own situation. The husband continues to have a logical explanation for everything. Really exhausted and all dizzy. Nervous exhaustion due to unaccustomed lifestyle. Or at least one that sounds logical, but are really just providing comfort through denial. The couple then make what is arguably their biggest mistake. Even though the inner refuge isn't sufficient, being exposed on one side and located right on the edge of the house, the guidebook and video say to stay within this refuge for 48 hours, and then once out, to not leave the shelter room for 14 days. Both of which the couple do not do. After an attack, you may have to stay in your home for about 14 days. So make sure to store plenty of water and food for your family. I forgot. We're supposed to stay in the inner core or refuge. Well, it's too late now. 
We've been out for ages. They make a note to show them grabbing and touching so many things, each time contaminating themselves more and more. But the final nail in the coffin is when they step foot outside, exposed to the toxic wind and rain, the sunny warm countryside turned to a dead wasteland, a grim sign of what's to come. And to be honest, it probably wouldn't have made much difference in the end because the windows were blown in during the blast, and there's one right next to their inner refuge, so their fallout room is already compromised. Not to mention their water supply is knocked over, so they have nothing to drink. Now, I don't know if this was intentional, it could just be the time period it was released, but the static and pixels that keep popping up make it seem like small dots of radiation all around them, like they can't escape it. The film then begins to introduce subtle hints that the pair are suffering from radiation poisoning. It begins with headaches, and feeling a little bit nauseous. I was sick three times in the night. My headache's even worse. Which the husband chocks up to shock and nerves. Nerves, dear, that's just nerves. <laughs> Everything is falling apart, but the pair are still trying to march forward, continue on with their happy life. They lie sunbathing surrounded by a wasteland. Everything around them just screams death. The whistling wind hammering home just how empty and lifeless the countryside around them has become. No more singing birds, just black trees and dying leaves. Still, it'll be lovely in the spring. It is spring, dear. Things just go from worse to worser. -er. Even if there was a minuscule chance of survival, it's snuffed out when it begins to rain. The husband sees it as salvation, as now they have something to drink. Rain, yes, we can save it. When in reality, it's the complete opposite. The same wind which has always been there in the background has blown the radiation directly to them. They are the unlucky ones. And this sequence, as great as it is, is actually quite different in the graphic novel, where instead of the landscape being just miserable, it's actually a sunny day. And so that naivety is a bit more believable. I mean, the page is quite bright and warm, apart from that deadly purple cloud just a small smudge of darkness on the horizon. But I can understand why it was changed from sunny to cloudy, because after the nuke strike, every scene is dark and colourless. So there's a case to be made that the way it's shown in the graphic novel clashes with the feeling that everything is dead and destroyed. But to be honest, I quite like them both, and I'm glad the film took a different approach. Now they've drunk the rainwater, it's not long until the inevitable happens. Their character designs begin to shift. And just a few simple changes turned what was once such a friendly design into something so hard to look at. Before, how do I put this? They're quite dumpy. God damn, little mama. His hair, you know what I'm saying? And then, as the radiation poisoning gets worse, subtle red patches appear around their eyes, and their once plump cheeks become gaunt. And a detail I really like is how the screen begins to pulse and vibrate, kind of like your vision coming in and out of focus very quickly. It's disorientating. The pair are beginning to hallucinate as their eyes and other organs begin to fail. And even when the sores begin to appear, the husband still has an answer for everything. Uh, various veins, that, that, that's what that is. That's, that's, that's nothing to worry about. Still fully confident that the guidebook will see them through and the government will come save them. The, the emergency services will have sprung into action the first alarm signal. And I know I've talked a lot about their naivety throughout this video, but there is something beautifully morbid and kind of respectable about their positivity. Once they've drunk the rainwater and stood in the toxic fog, their death has already pretty much been set in stone. And it's not exactly a nice way to go. So the fact they stay so hopeful, despite their bodies literally decaying and their home being destroyed, is kind of sweet. You know, what's happened has happened. If they're gonna die anyway, I guess it's better to go out with a smile, and at least they have each other. They're still cracking jokes and acting just as they did before the strike. What old sponge? <laughs> Miss a day's trade? Oh, not him. He'd rather die. They never changed their personality throughout this entire story, even when staring in the face of death. 
Yes, they could have spent more time researching and preparing, and the right decisions may have led to their survival, but they're not those kind of people. They're trusting and patriotic right until the end. Whether they know they're dying or not, the fact they never give up hope is why you're rooting so much for these characters, and why it's so much more tragic to see what happens to them. And it's believed the couple are based off the author's parents, so I don't think he'd write a whole graphic novel just about how naive they are. Even though that's a part of the story, I don't think it's the point. It's not supposed to be a criticism of this elderly couple who make a few mistakes, it's a criticism of those in power for failing to provide sufficient advice, but more so for even even getting to the point of nuclear war in the first place. Almost as if to say, these nuclear weapons won't just hurt these government leaders and officials who go back and forth, but also everyday people, most of which are so disconnected from the tensions and conflict that they don't even know what they're dying for. They're the enemy. Oh yes, I keep forgetting. Now, this is probably a good time to mention that there's actually a theory which points towards the husband being aware of what's happening to them, but acting like everything's fine because he doesn't want to scare ducks, letting her go out peacefully. After all, he is quite knowledgeable on nuclear warfare and war in general. He talks about megatons and the different scales of nuclear weapons, megadeath and the number of casualties. So many millions of people dead per bang. Any catch up, dear? He knows of Hiroshima and Fallout, and has a vague recollection of people dying days after the explosion, but he can't remember what of. And whilst this theory definitely has legs, there's a lot of stuff which I think goes against it. For one, it's his idea to drink the rainwater. His idea to use the living room as a Fallout room on the edge of the house, rather than the cellar, and I don't think he would have been so relaxed had he known the gravity of their situation. But it's interesting to think about. If this this is true, I think the moment he makes his decision would be right here. Let's have a walk round the garden, dear. I've just read it's only 48 hours in the inner core of refuse, not 14 days. You see, they've already left the fallout room and exposed themselves to the radiation, so there's a chance that he has read further into the booklet or remembered what happened to the poor souls of Hiroshima and knows what's coming next, and just doesn't want to spend the little time they have left cramped into a tight refuge. But if I'm really being honest with myself, I think it's more theory than fact. But still, let me know whether you think he knows or not, by this point in the graphic novel, almost all colour has drained from the page. It's as though the ink on the page has decayed and melted away, exposing the white behind the panels. And this drawing of James I think perfectly sums up his character with a single image, singing a jolly song about smiling, arms outstretched with a big grin on his face, but pale with blood dripping from his mouth so clearly near the end, but still looking on the bright side. Now, remember those paper bags from earlier? Well, the wife suggests they get back inside them. Shall we get into the, those paper bags again? In case another bomb goes off while they're asleep, because remember, they still believe the bags are for extra protection from the blast, even though they're so thin you can rip them with your fingers. Really, what he'd struggle to remember earlier on is how you were recommended to use whatever you could to cover the deceased, and a very common household item which would do the job is potato sacks. If anyone dies while you are kept in your fallout room, move the body to another room in the house. Label the body with name and address, and cover it as tightly as possible in polythene, paper, sheets or blankets. Like a makeshift body bag. Same goes for the medical and ID cards on the list. The reason you want to keep these nearby is because if you're injured, it's useful to know your medical status, and if you're dead, they want to be able to ID you. The pair then climb into these sacks, showing how they're already dead, essentially walking talking corpses, still laughing away. Now you know what it feels like to be a potato. <laughs> still completely unaware of the context of what they're doing, still following the government's instructions up until the end without even realising it. The powers that be will get to us in the end. 
notice how earlier on, the bags were animated in the same smooth cartoon style as the characters, back when things were less serious, but here, the bags are 3D, dirty and realistic, covered in shadow like the devastated house behind them, and they're completely covered so there's no more 2D animation, the fairy tale is over, and realism has set in. The talk of being buried and the wife asking if they should pray are clear signs that subconsciously they've accepted their fate. The room is so dark now that you can barely make out the wooden doors of the refuge, but it's not a completely dark ending. The pair then ascend into the blue sky. They likely passed away the very same night. And whilst they also pass away in the graphic novel, the ending is much darker because there is no rising into the heavens for the sweet couple. No return of the sun and blue skies. Instead, we end on a page full of dark grey panels, the couple not even visible in the shadows, and the last lines are haunting. The husband recites a calming prayer, you got dearly beloved, comfort me, I shall fear no evil, before ending with lay me down in green pastures. You know, nice final thoughts to have. But after a pause, he continues with a poem instead, into the valley of the shadow of death, and suddenly his words aren't so comforting anymore. Duck's crying out for him to stop, but he continues, and that's the last panel. Now, these last two lines are from a poem called The Charge of the Light Brigade, and despite being written in the 1840s, it has many similarities to When the Wind Blows. The poem pays tribute to a group of British soldiers who obeyed their commander's instructions to attack Russian troops, but unfortunately, their orders were misinterpreted and the men were sent in the wrong direction, resulting in a massacre. It's a poem about following those in charge no matter what, even if it leads to your own death. And even though it focuses on the vague instructions and failings of those in charge, the takeaway is the bravery of those following the orders instead. And it's likely a coincidence, but I do find it quite interesting that it happens to be about a British and Russian conflict. But whilst that battle and that war ultimately had a winner, here, no side is victorious. But even so, in both cases, there is a devastating loss of life which could have been avoided. With the way that When the Wind Blows is presented, it's easy to get lost in all the decisions and guidebooks and think the chances of survival come down to the couple, but really, they were dead the moment the first faceless man pressed a button somewhere far off in the distance. And we assume it's the Russians who have killed the couple, but who knows? It's mutually assured destruction. We can't know for sure which country fired first in the terrifying standoff that is nuclear war. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. If you made it to this part in the video, you have no idea how much that means to little old me. Um, we recently hit 20,000 subscribers. That is honestly insane. Let me know in the comments what I should cover next. And as always, thank you. I love you. Goodbye.